Hello and welcome to the preview show. We've got a big game this weekend to preview against South End, and I am joined by two big names in Sunderland history. Graham Anderson covered the club for how long? 20 years, and I've written more words on the Sunderland Football Club than anyone in history. Do you know that for a fact? I do because the man who's written the second most words on Sunderland Football Club is Rob Mason. And we were sitting at the table once, and Rob Mason, the, the programme editor, said, Graham, do you realise that we're the people who've written the most words on Sunderland Football Club? Which I hadn't realised up until that point. But then, you know what Rob's like? He's got his little graphs and he showed me. <laughs> very good. I'd like to know how he worked that out. That would be a very boring Well, it'll, it'll take about 20 minutes, and you haven't got the time on the podcast. <laughs> and we've also got Dave Corner, former Sunderland player. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. Very, very good. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to touch on the game at the weekend against Shrewsbury. Um, it was a defeat. I think the performance was good. We hit the bar three times. And I'll throw us to Dave. How frustrating is it when you hit the bar three times in a game and don't score? It's it's very frustrating. Um, that you know, it, it takes a bit of confidence away from the players, and uh, all they want to do now is get on to the next game and and try to redeem themselves. Obviously, get a get a good win against Southampton, which I believe that uh, Southend, sorry, which I believe they, they should do. Um, if they play at the best, um, because Southampton, uh, South, I will say Southampton, Southend are going through a bad time at the moment. Uh, obviously, they've got a new manager; they'll want to impress him. Uh, but um, certainly, against Shrewsbury, we, we did play okay. Um, the, imp- the performance was a little bit better than the previous two, I believe. Um, against Wickham, um, then you go further back against Lincoln. I think the performance was that—that that was the worst I've seen Sunderland uh, this season. And uh, ultimately, you've got Jack Ross the sack. And Graham, th- th- that Shrewsbury game, I mean, you've covered something for many years, so I'm sure you probably have seen a game of Sons at the bar three times. But how frustrating is that for a manager? You know, going in there, you've probably done your preparation right if you have had the chances to score. How frustrating is it to not get the win? Well, I remember covering a game once where Sullivan scored three own goals in 10 minutes. And I think that's probably about as bad as it can get for a manager. Nothing is, worth, nothing is as bad as that. But uh, when you talk to the players, in games where when they hit the woodwork, especially in games where there's narrow margins and they're trying so hard, when you hit the woodwork, your heart kind of sinks and it's kind of, oh, you know, and then and you, get, and you hit it a second time or a third time, uh, I think it, it can really yeah. demoralise players because then you sort of think we're never going to win here. You just, you, just, yeah. you just think it's never going to happen, you know, and uh, so it, it, it takes something out of you. And it takes some play to, to bounce back and hopefully they'll bounce back for the next game. What the management team has got to be saying to them, I'm sure they will, is you're that close. You're that close to three goals. Don't let, you know, they'll, they'll replay the game and they'll go over it and they'll, like, they'll examine it. And they'll want the players to take out of it the fact that, you know, on, on any other given day, two of those might have gone in, all three of them might have gone in. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Oxford midweek, it's a competition that you know, Dave, played in the, the Milk Cup final, but we'll... Not touching that too much, <laughs> um, but a defeat on penalties. How how horrible is it to lose a game in a penalty shootout? Be essentially, a game of luck after working so hard for ninety minutes. Well, it, it, again, it's all to do about confidence. Uh, if they if they'd won that, the, the confidence would have been sky high. It, it, it would not put them back a little bit, but I believe again the, the performance was again slightly better. Played against the Oxford team, who I believe a fifth or sixth yeah. in the league, um, and really. It, it, we were the better team uh, on the night, I believe, just. But um, it went down to penalties, and anybody could win a penalty shootout. Um, it's just a little bit of luck, you know. You hit the bar, hit the post, keeper saves it, whatever. It's just a little bit of luck. I think some of the penalties, man. I think they were probably one of the poorest I've seen. Uh, they weren't. They weren't the best, you know. Sky. One of the one of the lads, but sky high. Um, it's unfortunate, uh, but as I say, we just need to bounce back for the next game. And there were two more woodworks hit midweek as well, so that makes it five or two games. Yeah, well, I think I think that sort of starts to speak to mentality. That, that, that's the danger then, is that the mentality of the players they start getting a siege mentality, and you, and you start beating yourself before you even got out there. Or we're never going to, nothing's going our way, and, and, and you get that negative mindset. And maybe with the, the, the quality of the penalties, you saw a bit of that. It's almost all that the players will be thinking about here is probably you know maybe even the cup final from last year's on their mind sort of stuff it didn't go against them then it's not going to go against us now and then and, and, and then you sort of start it becomes a self-fulfilling thing uh, i think i'm not that it was disappointing to go out in the way they did i'm not that bothered if someone go out of all the cup, cup uh, competitions early at all I'm, I'm just not that bothered I, th- I think we've got bigger fish to fry this season i think going out on um penalties especially when you've been the better side like you mm-hmm. say david that that's really hard to take um, but I think the main thing at the moment is trying to get a set of other team right. Phil Parkinson's only knew him. You'll still be trying to find out what his best combination is. I think 
they've got three cup games coming up and we'll get on those later on but I think the main thing is getting his team right is more important than progress in the cup Dave would you agree with that do you think as a player your mentality is let's focus on the league or do you think they will have went into that going yeah we would we'll want to get through this competition and get them extra games and get as far as we can as a professional as a professional footballer you want to win every every football game you go in with the mentality I want to win I want to win without you know without any conditions I want to win but you know yourself the priority this season is to get out of this league and to start climbing back up notably back into the Premiership and as Graham says we've got to concentrate mainly on the league and it, and it, and it takes a little bit of a distraction another distraction away and uh, although the players will be disappointed at that, at that result um, as the Oxford I'm sure they'll be uh, now fully concentrated on the league and uh, hopefully start climbing the table and uh, get back up there with the, the top the leaders. The last home game we played was a, a nice 5 0 win, so that was a day where everything seemed to go right for Sunderland. Do you think the fact that South End have lost 7 1 recently, lost 3 1 last time out, do you think Sunderland can go in that thing and. We might have a chance for another high-scoring game here. Well, they could. Uh, they could, and fingers crossed that they will. Um, I think that uh, it, not quite a do-or-die times here, but they, 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 we're, we're here at statement times. I think you know that that five-nil was fantastic morale booster. Yes, the problem of the uh, of the team this season has been inconsistency, but the, I'm hoping that they'll be so fired up for this weekend's game because they'll never get a better chance in terms of the statistics. Uh, but then I've I've I had a career where every week you're writing that sort of story. It seems where it's kind of like you know someone's there for the taking. I mean the, the the usual one is that some some striker hasn't scored in 17 games. You know and you think yeah, it's going to score against That's Sunderland and that, uh, it usually happens. You know it's that sort of thing. So I, I take nothing for granted. But I think that you know Dave's right in the sense that you'll have you'll never have a better chance really. I think uh, a victory, especially ahead of these. Non, not football league, league games coming up. The three not coming up. I think it's really important a victory because for a few weeks now the table will be set in stone in all league games. And I think if you can see yourself, you know, in the playoff positions or up there, it, it makes a hell of a difference mentally. As opposed to losing this game or getting a draw, and you see yourself mid-table for a few weeks. Um, so again, it's all about trying to get the players' morale up. And I think that would, a victory is really, really important. Yeah. Without doubt, I mean, let's make no bones about it. If we don't win comfortably well against South End, it'll be a well, it'll be another setback. Um, and uh, look, if we win and we win handsomely, and we win well, play by playing well, it'll give the players, the manager, the new manager, a big boost. But you've got to, you, obviously, we've got to think about South End. They've got a new manager, and they're, they're out to impress. So. Yeah, some some of those players have really got to step up because yes. uh, it's a fr it's, it's a fragile time for the fans, uh, and you cannot blame the fans for that. You know, sort of it's they're, they're in a difficult position. The supporters they come to every game and they want to support and they want the team to do well. But at the same time, I don't think any fans in football over the last ten years have had as much to put up with as Sunderland fans have uh, have had. So the players have got to give the players have got to lead on the front foot. They've got to give the fans something to, to cheer about. They've got to go in there without any fear. Uh, and not, and if, if a pass goes astray or something doesn't go, or, or if they hit the woodwork this time, not let the head stop at any stage. Um, and the management, the new management team will have a role to play in that in making sure that the players' heads are right for that game. Did talk about new managers. We've both got relatively new managers. Phil Parkinson's, you know, this will be his fifth game. Yeah. Sol Campbell will be his second. As a player, what, what is the difference when a new manager comes in? Is it people trying harder, or is it just? fresh eyes on the team and what do you think makes the difference? Well the players are in a different situation, each, each player is different because you've, you've got the established players who will be thinking well he might come in and I've been playing for the last six seven games and he might he might have his own ideas and I might be out of the team then you've got the players who are on the fringe who are beating says well I've got a big chance here so so the players will be different mindsets you know and uh, all, all you, can, you can go out to do as a professional footballer is do your best on a day-to-day -day basis in training. Show the manager, the new manager, what catches eye. Be impactive on, on in training, in practice games, and then so hopefully get picked for the game. But then once you're picked for the game, you have to provide on the pitch. And once you provide on the pitch for the new manager, that imprints in his brain. And he think, well, he's done it for me. He's done it, you know, so I'll keep playing. And uh, basically, so. Different players have different mindsets, and uh, the established ones um, and the, the up-and-coming ones who are on the fringe, 
Um, they'll all be wanting to impress. That's the main thing. They'll have to impress him uh, in order to stay in the team or to get into the team. I imagine. I mean, I imagine Saul Campbell will be a really. Uh, I mean, you, you could write a whole book on the whole new manager bounce, whether it's a myth or not. I think you do get a new manager bounce when, they, because usually it's because there's been a lot of problems at the club, whether it's the, manager, the previous manager's fault or not. But then that manager goes, and it feels as though people are have a release now. They can play better, or they, they might not play better. So, and it can, it can change the season round for for a while. I mean, I think Sunderland had a few seasons of that where they kept changing the manager and they kept surviving and so on and so forth. Uh, but Sooner or later, if there are problems there, they did for the last manager, they'll probably resurface and it's up to the new manager to get to grips with it as quickly as he possibly can and change it so that, that momentum he gets when he first comes in with a, with a clean slate for everybody, he can solve the problems that existed previously by, by bringing new players in or changing formations or whatever it is or changing the squad. Um, that's his job. In terms of uh, South End, uh, so that would be really interesting because Sol Campbell uh, have you ever met Sol Campbell? Have you ever? I haven't met him. No, well, no. I haven't met him either, but Steve Bruce almost signed him uh, for Sunderland at one point, right in the twilight of his career, about 33, 34. Uh, and Steve Bruce, who was a, a big fella himself, he said like he couldn't believe the size of Sol Campbell. And he said, uh, you know, if, he said, uh, until you're standing shoulder to shoulder, you don't realise the physically impressive nature of the, of the fella. And I think if he's gone into South End where they're lacking in confidence yeah. and this man mountain, former England international, comes in there, who's done a great job previously somewhere else, it might just give you the lift that you need, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I heard a story. I, I've never met Saul Campbell, but I heard a story about him that he used to eat the biggest pre match meals that's ever been seen. <laughs> Uh, let's hope he gives the South End players the same sort of meals <laughs> on Saturday. Well, I think I think I think I wouldn't be surprised if South End come out of the blocks a little bit as well. A terrible run, second off the bottom of the, in the table, and I think a lot of teams have benefited, uh, maybe last season and maybe in the previous season, of coming to Sunderland and thinking, right, massive club, look at this place, it's like a Wembley for them, nothing to lose, let's have, let's give it a go. Um, so I, th I I don't think there'll be pushovers, and I think that first 10, 20 minutes will be interesting. But then if Sunderland are dominating, you might find the South End team start to run out of team, steam at home. Yeah, absolutely spot on, Graham, because I think, don't you think it happens to most teams who, are, who come to the stadium and like, they think it's, it's, it's Wembley to them, you know, and it, it looks, they're playing in a magnificent stadium, a large crowd, and uh, they, lift, they lift themselves. Nothing to lose either. Exactly. It's like we're expecting yeah. a beat, so let's, let's have some fun, let's have a, have a go. And if you're, if you're playing against a really good Sunderland team with confidence, that's difficult. But if you're playing against a, a, a team which, I mean, this is, this is the accusation of Jack Ross's teams, that they tend to kind of play within themselves almost, try and get the goal and sit back, that sort of stuff. It almost encourages teams to have a go at you. So I think that's why Sunderland have got to be on the front foot, they've got to be positive, they've got to get the fans behind them. Kevin Ball used to say that... Uh, it, in Sunderland, uh, a tackle, a really fantastic meaty tackle, was as good as a goal. You didn't, it didn't have to be a goal to get the crowd going. You can be sort of, you know, you can be committed. You can be sort of, you can really show you, you're at the races. Uh, and I think that's what Sunderland have to do. I think, you know, they've had a bit of a, a setback after the tramway games. A couple of really sort of, you know, it's, it, things which can knock the wind out of your sails a little bit. But they need to kind of take a few days and think, right, reset, South End, great opportunity, go for it. I think they should try and remember the 5 nil against Tranmere more than remember the two games in between. Right. Use that as an inspiration say, right, we're home again. Remember what happened last time we are at home. Let's go for it. That's right. We'll touch now on the Leasing.com trophy. So we've got Leicester City under-21s next week, which it almost hurts to say playing another 21 side when you're Sunderland AFC. But what's your views on the competition? Do you think this is a competition Sunderland need to be targeting like they did last year? Or do you think it's a one that you know maybe we need to play a lot of the fringe players and use it as a chance for them to show themselves? It's, it's very, very difficult for a club like Sunderland playing against an under-21 team. Um, but you've got to think, it does give a chance, the team to get back to Wembley, gives the, the fans a, a, a day out. Um, again, it's a professional game, so they'll be going out to win and, and, and they will go out to win. But it's, it's very difficult to play against, after all, what, what, what they call in the game, the kids, under-21s, the, the, they're the babies of the club, you know? And uh, if, they, if they don't beat them, they're on, they're on a loser, aren't they? If they win, they're expected to win. If they don't win, they'll be ridiculed, you know? There's no doubt. If I was Phil Parkinson, I'd be looking to uh, play a strong side. I mean, I think the temptation is like, so, well, it's, only, it's, 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 it's not a priority for us and we'll play the kids. And while I've said that I don't, I'm not bothered about going out of the comp competitions this year early, and I'm not, if I was Phil Parkinson and I was a manager, I'd probably be thinking, you know what? These are, game, these are, these are competitions that aren't that important 
to us in the whole grand scheme of things. But this is a game where I might be, I, I fancy a partnership here or a partnership there, and I'd like to experiment. Um, and not a youth team partnership, but a first team partnership. You know, can he play with him? Will that work? He can experiment with the idea of I've, I've got three games now which aren't league games. I can play strong sides, I can work out what combinations might work a little bit more so that when we come back into the league action I've got a much better idea because I think if you're looking for consistency and that's what we're looking for in terms of results you need a settled side as much as possible so I would, if I was Phil Partenstein use these next three games play strong teams to try and work out what is the best team for this league Potential momentum builder as well. If you if you do beat Leicester, then you play Gillingham in the FA Cup the weekend. You could potentially be there. Then we've got Scunthorpe in the competition again. This competition, at least in the Trophy, potential for three wins there, and the whole picture looks different. It's all about getting into habits, good habits, winning habits. And once a team goes onto the pitch, it, well, we've won the last three, so we, we, you know they're they're in a winning momentum, and uh, that, that could be really good for the football club. Okay, we're going to do some quick fires now just to, to finish off. So we've got some quick fires and then we're going to do some uh, a quiz, <laughs> which is a football quiz and a bit of general knowledge in there. So we'll see how we do with that. But we'll start with you, Graham. Who's the best manager that you've had to deal with in Sunderland? Uh, I'll speak as a journalist. Uh, I covered everyone from Reedy um, up until recently. Um, and uh, the best manager that I worked with was Steve Bruce. And I know that might people are probably throwing things at the screen now, sort of <laughs> stuff like you know. But uh, you speak as you find. In terms of, um, yeah, I think I think he was a good manager. Anyway, I know it ended really badly. But if you look at it, you know, he was. He got them finished. He did finish tenth. I know it was a kind of almost a false tenth because yeah. it was tenth on the last day of the season. But yeah, you know, I think there was one point where the front line was Darren Bent. Um, Welbeck and Asimov Shian, you know, and yeah, the ball was ended. He, he, he had a decent team. Uh, but from a journalist point of view, he was absolutely brilliant for me. I mean, as a journalist, what for the Sunday Neck, or you're a back page to fill every day and more. Uh, and really, all you as a local man who's got to be there every day and try and get the best stories, and more importantly, the right, the correct stories, not lies, not rumours, but be on the button every time. He would genuinely tell us what was going on, I would, I, 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 and he would take us into his confidence, and that's all you want from. That's the best thing you can get from a manager. I think things have improved at the club in that respect in recent times, but some managers would be very difficult. Wouldn't tell you anything. Um, Re had an exceptionally good relationship with Reedy, but in terms of someone who would really kind of be helpful to a journalist, Steve Bruce would be the best for me. Dave, who's the best manager you've had? I Graham mentioned earlier over the last few years, Sullen have had a, a, a lot of managers. But I don't think it's just over the last few years. Certainly in my time, from 19, I think I joined the club in 82 to 89. Uh, I was there seven and a half years. I had eight managers in that period of time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's going back even further, Grim, yeah. you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I started with Ken Knighton um, and then uh, finished off with Dennis Smith. But in the meantime, I had obviously Lenny Ashurst, Larry Bapp, Menemy, uh, who. <laughs> there was a few, yeah, there was a few. Uh, and then a few. And some caretakers. Caretaker managers, you know. And. Uh, but over that period of time, I would say the best manager I had, uh, purely for developmental reasons, was uh, Alan Durban. Um, and he was at the, the start of my career. Um, I was in the squad a few times just before he got the sack. He got the sack when Sunderland were actually six in the old first division. <laughs> um, and uh, Incredible, really. It was, it was. And uh, he, he got the sack then. Um, and because I'll, I'll, because they weren't exciting football, it, yeah. it was the idea. It had to be seen as too dull. And, and you, meant, you mentioned earlier how, how do you feel when a new manager comes in? At that particular stage in my, my career, I was I was disappointed. Durban got the sack because I was I was flying high with him, and then I, then Lenny Ashurst came in, and uh, I was thinking, well, I'm going to have to prove myself all again. But Lenny, so uh, Durban was the, probably the best for my development. But Lenny went on to give me uh, my debut against Notts Forest in 1984. And uh, which I'll never ever um, forget, you know, it was, it, was, it was fantastic. And obviously, then five games later, Lenny picked this for the for the final. So Durban and Lenny Ashurst were, were my uh, my favourites, if that's the right word. I met Alan Durban, he, he and uh, saw him quite a few times because he worked under Reedy for a while. Reedy brought him in his first season or two, and uh, what an intelligent man! And 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 really. I mean, you sit in his company and you learn a lot and it, it, on the technical side of things uh, that's probably why he helped you with this game I just yeah. thought I was so impressed by how he would break down players movements and, and how, they, how they worked as a team and his partnerships you know uh, sixth with the sixth when the second yeah yeah 
Okay, next one, we're going to go a little bit quicker on these ones. Oh, sorry, yeah, we'll talk forever. So, best moment covering Sunderland, Graham? Uh, the one thing is, oh, the, the game that always stands out in my mind, I mean, sort of the derby, every derby victory, uh, because I felt the pain of the fans when they lost, I felt the passion when they won. Every derby victory, but in terms of, of almost the perfect game, that, that Chelsea game, uh, and you've heard it before. If you were, were you at that game, the 4-0, oh, four, four sorry. That was 4-5 <laughs> at the time. I can't even know that. I'm one for the Bairn as well. Uh, no, uh, that was just incredible. Four, uh, four goals before half-time, totally steamrolled Chelsea. And that Kevin Phillips, perfect volley from outside the area was amazing. Same question for you, Dave. What's the best moment of your career? Um, Best moment, obviously, people are going to be thinking. I, I'm going to mention walking up with Wembley in the, in the cup final, which was again unforgettable moment. Uh, but uh, not long after that, we played uh, Manchester United. I don't know if you remember this group. Played Man- if you remember um, Manchester United at Roker Park, full house. Brian Robson was playing, McGrath was playing, uh, Mark Hughes, Whiteside, um, and it was a full house in the atmosphere. I remember being picked for it, and it was, it was an incredible game. We actually with the it was on match of the day at the time, but at the time there was only two games on match of the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, we drew nil-nil. McGrath kicked one off the line at the last few seconds. Uh, Brian Robson, the then England captain, was sent off on the game for, um, I think he kicked Barry Verison. And uh, I think a few people were ready to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that game was just, it just stands out in my memory. Uh, obviously we, we went on to play the following Wednesday at Old Trafford and got big 3 nil in the replay but uh, it, was, it, was, it was a great game to be involved in always great atmospheres with man, with man oh, at Roger Park yes fantastic last one worst moment covering Sunderland um, I don't know I think uh, it's been so many uh, <laughs> but I think I, I think as a journalist the long runs the 19 point season the 15 point season the long runs uh, where they were losing and losing and losing that, that was soul sapping uh, losing top quality players I haven't seen them transferred when you thought they could have stayed at Sunderland longer I, I, I was very saddened to see Bridges go and, and, Lee, Cl- and Lee Clark and Alan Johnson at the same time that, that sticks out in my mind but maybe just maybe probably uh, was the, uh, either the the playoff final defeat uh, or possibly the the the, 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 uh, the one nil defeat at Wimbledon. This is one of your very first season. I think, I think you feel when you're younger, you feel the emotions more intensely, and that was that was my early season and that uh, my first full season possibly. Uh, and Sunderland went down the last day of the season, 40 points, played at Wimbledon, didn't perform, lost one nil, and everyone expected that Timeson would probably win that, that game or get a point at least from that game, and you'd have had the stadium alight in the Premier League from the start. So yeah, it, was a t- it worked out well in the long run, but at the time that was as bad as it got. Same question for you, Dave. What's the worst moment of yours? Um, again, people are probably thinking, well, it got, got beat in the, in the Mill Cup final, but that was just so memorable at the time. Um, it has to be, which just it's come to mind straight away, uh, when we got beat off Gillingham in the playoffs in 1986-87. Mm. Uh, we went down to the third division. Um, and uh, basically, I just remember that the night of that, the game at Roker Park, which was probably one of the worst of my life, you know, it was, it was if somebody had died in our family, you know. Um, being part of a team that, for the first, first time, first, first time, time, first time in the club's history, the third division, and um, and it was it was just devastating blow to to the team, to the players individually, and and to the club. Luckily, we had the players to bounce straight back, uh, but it was it was a it was a bad uh, bad time when we went down. We'll finish off now. We're going to do the program quiz. So this is from the Tramia game. This was in the program. So if you, oh. I, did, well, well, I didn't see the program. I, I, did. I didn't see the program. I didn't get Rob Mason's program. Sorry, Rob. Really sorry about that. All right. First one. Which club did Peter Reid take charge of after he left Sunderland in two thousand and two? Was it Leeds? Was Leeds correct? Well done, Graham. Next one. Which ex Sunderland manager who managed the club for three hundred fifty-three games over a seven-year period managed Plymouth Argyle between two thousand and ten and eleven? Peter Reid. Peter Reid again. Bit of a theme going on there. Did Peter write this? No, he didn't. That's the last Peter Reid question. From which Russian club did Sunderland loan Jan Envia for the 2015-16 season? I don't know that one. That's the guess. Russian club. Donetsk. Locomotive. No. Ruben Kazan. Who won the first ever Premier League in 1992? Blackburn. No. Liverpool. Actually, I think it's 93. 92. 93. 93. Uh, they're Leeds. Man United. 
Leeds won the previous year. Yeah. Leeds won the previous year, yeah. So Leeds, I think, did win at 92. So, yeah. So I get a half point for that. Yeah, half <laughs> point. Who scored the goal that kept Bradford City in the Premier League at the end of the 1999 2000 season? I'd be very surprised if you get this. 99-2000? Yeah. It's was a famous it? one because you always see it on the telly. Was it Dean Windus or was it Fraser Campbell? No, it was David Weatherall. Right. Right. Set it off, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Set it off, yeah. Who are the current NHL Stanley Cup champions? That's ice hockey. <laughs> right. You must know at least one American ice hockey team, surely. No. No, not no. one. No one. No. New York. I was just about to say St. Louis there. Yeah. Yeah. I, heard him, I heard him definitely yeah, said St. Louis. I was just about to say that. Yeah, you got to send out. I saw it was my favourite sport. What is the capital of Egypt? Cairo. Cairo. Well done. Who was Winston Churchill's successor as Prime Minister in 1945? Um, his successor in the Tory party was Anthony Eden. His successor in the, in the, as Prime Minister was Clement Attlee. Well done. Which actor you were 12 then, don't you? Walter White. <laughs> I, I covered it for the echo. <laughs> Which actor played Walter White in the hit TV series Breaking Bad? Never even seen it. Uh, I, I can see him. He was in. Uh, he was the father in Malcolm in the Middle. Uh, but I did, couldn't give you his name. Brian Cranston. Final football one. Which side was top of the Premier League on January 1st, 2000? Oh, that's good. I think I think that that that's a good question that because I think that was something could have gone top then I think um, something was second at Christmas I think that and that there was I remember the West Ham something like against West Ham at West Ham and I remember covering thinking for the football echo thinking if someone win this and they were winning as well was it last minute goal yeah, they'll go top it? yeah and Danny Diccio they brought on Danny Diccio as a sub and not only did he miss a sit there he then he then tried a back pass which was intercepted um, so I'll say. Arsenal. Do you want to take a guess? Manchester United. Leeds United. Oh, bloody Yeah, had all the kids that year, Michael Bridges. And Bridges, yeah, the, the, Harry Kuehl. Yeah. Alan Mark Vadu getting Alan Smith. Yeah. Fantastic four up front. Yeah, okay, well that sums that up. So I wonder, uh, let us know in the comments, I suppose, how many you got right in that one. How many did you get right there, Graham? I think you must have got seven. And oh, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's a team effort. Well, well thanks, I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but thanks for coming on and... Um, I'm sure we'll be back on. Welcome back in the future. Well, if I am, I'll, I'll, brush, up, I'll brush up on my ice hockey. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot.